started. Um, yeah, go ahead and get started. So welcome, welcome everyone, welcome panelists and participants. I'm the South County Task Force uh, Deputy Chair, and this is a general meeting of the South County Task Force open to the public. We're a 45 year old citizens organization dedicated to supporting housing, health care, and equity in the Richmond Highway area of Fairfax County. Among other things, we hold four to five general meetings a year on topics of special interest to the Richmond Highway community. Often these meetings involve exploring new ideas that we later develop into advocacy projects or publications. This is that kind of meeting. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to our chair, Mary Payton, um, to make a brief statement about the purpose of the meeting. And then she and I will introduce our special guests and panelists. Take it away, Mary. Hey, hello everybody. Good to see you here. I'm gonna say a few words about this meeting to kind of set up some out of the box thinking. This is a brainstorming meeting and I wanna make sure everybody's kind of on board with that. Um, we're not gonna hold any of the supervisors responsible for actually doing any of the things they say in the next week. So, you know, feel free to, feel free to speculate. Okay, so this meeting grew out of a couple of community meetings we held last summer at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Gum Springs. So at the second meeting called, Can We Have Development Without Displacement? Uh, we asked residents of Hybla Valley and Gum Springs how they wanted to see their community develop and they had plenty of ideas. Uh, and over the past several years, other people have also had lots of ideas about as the county has developed the Embark plan to widen Route 1 and install a bus rapid transit from Fort Belvoir to the Huntington Metro and attract high density mixed development along the route. Uh, some welcomed that plan as a long awaited upgrade while others feared it as a gentrification that would force them out of the county. So in a spate of recent comp plan amendment proposals, uh, just over the past month or so, we've seen how owners of property outside the Embark boundaries are expecting it to attract development, uh, mainly high density residential development uh, to on land that is now mobile home parks, workforce housing, and a neighborhood shopping center. So I started wondering, I was on these uh, panels and I started wondering exactly how a community could influence its own development. And I thought we might need to have a broad out of the box brainstorming session with some experts and some locals. So this is it. We hope to raise some good ideas that we can share and uh, develop with others. So I'm gonna start out by saying something way, way out of the box. Uh, and this is an idea I got from India, I, I edit policy papers for a living. And this is an idea that came out of one of those policy papers. So I'm asking who started this particular development. And as often happens uh, in, in cities, uh, the county did uh, with a lot of financial help from the state and federal governments to build a transportation infrastructure and develop a plan and a set of tax incentives to attract developers. It's a very intentional and very expensive uh, plan paid for with taxpayer money to prepare a fertile field for private development. Uh, so this taxpayer payer funded development plan, uh, like any, hopes to benefit all residents. But it will create economic winners and losers outside the plan area and the Route 1 community. The immediate economic winners will be landowners whose property values go up and who can sell or develop it for a big profit. The losers will be the low income people who will be pushed out of the area, both homeowners and property, whose property values and taxes therefore are go up and renters who are pushed out by higher rents or demolition and rebuilding of their apartments into luxury condos. So that's especially the hundreds of mobile homeowners who stand to lose not only their homes, but their entire investment in their homes, uh, which are no longer mobile. Anyway, that's the typical gentrification as seen in DC and other Eastern cities. And I know we're trying not to do that here, but um, we still need to figure out how not to do it. As Richard Rothstein revealed in The Color of Law, redlining was a government plan. 
housing segregation was a government plan. And I think gentrification is often a government plan, at least for large scale government investment creates economic winners and losers around it. So um, here's my question. When government actors create winners and losers, does the government have a responsibility to even out the economic outcomes? Should it impose a windfall uh, profit taxes on lucky landowners and provide community development funding and subsidies for low income neighborhoods? Uh, can, be, can community development be done through a one Fairfax lens? Uh, this might also make improving vulnerable communities for the current residents a responsibility of government. And I know Virginia has strong property rights. I'm not naive about that, but I'm just putting that out there as a different way of thinking. Uh, many think of low-income community development as something that's good to do if possible, if possible, uh, which usually means if, if um, economical for developers. Uh, sometimes you have to go way out of the box to look back on an issue with fresh eyes. So I have just gone way further out of the box than our special guest, Alexander von Hoffman, who is a leader in equitable community development thinking. So I'm going to let him define the concept of, of equitable development and how it came to be and how it has worked in some places. And I've asked him to challenge us on how we could apply it in the Richmond Highway community around Embark. And what would it look like? What policies, what economic incentives would help make it work? Uh, what would we have to change? So I invited Mr. Von Hoffman because I read some of his writings on equitable development. And I actually sat through about a three hour Zoom workshop inspired by his recent publication, The Ingredients of Equitable Development Planning, which also showed three case studies in which communities tried to apply the concept. Uh, so we are aware of the uh, county task forces on preservation of affordable housing and on equity. And we hope to channel some of this thinking uh, to those members. So we're not, um, we're, we're not unaware of what they're doing. So the format will, uh, will um, be, and we're going to do some introductions first, but the format will be Mr. Von Hoffman will give us about 15 minutes with a slideshow on equitable, equitable development. He'll take some questions from the panelists, and then we'll have a few questions Larissa will ask to the panel to discuss, and then finally we'll take questions from the participants. So I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Von Hoffman, and I think Larissa, can, will you introduce the panel after that so people don't get too tired of me? <laughs> no problem. Okay. Uh, so Alexander Von Hoffman uh, is a senior research fellow and lecturer in the urban planning and design department at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He's a historian by training. He's the author of many, many books and scholarly articles on housing and community development. Uh, numerous working papers and case studies on urban development, housing policy and practice. And most recently, the aforementioned ingredients of equitable development planning. Um, Dr. Ron Hoffman has also written essays on housing and urban development for general interest periodicals, including Atlantic Monthly, New York Times, Chicago Tribune, and Boston Globe. So we got to get a list of those because people are more likely to read those. Uh, his current major research projects are a history of low-income housing policy in the United States, the emergence of the issue of the preservation of affordable housing, and the rise of regulatory barriers to affordable development in greater Boston. Dr. Von Hoffman was an associate professor of urban planning and design at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and a fellow at the Taubman Center for State and Local Government at the Harvard Kennedy School. Okay, and Larissa, you can introduce our first panelist, um, actually has some, some similar roots at Harvard. So go ahead and introduce them and maybe okay. you can show them. Um, sure. Um, so Professor Howard Mack um, is assistant professor at Morgan State University uh, School of Architecture and Planning. 
Baltimore and at the Howard University School of Architecture in Washington, DC. Um, he was also an instructor at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design, Cambridge, where he received a Master of Design degree in architecture um, in 2008. He also has a Master of Architecture, five-year professional degree from Hampton University. Um, Professor Mack lived in Gum Springs for eight years, so he knows this area. He is also on the Fairfax County Affordable Housing Preservation Task Force and the NAACP Housing Committee. Um, Howard currently teaches a housing design studio class that focuses on townhome, multifamily, and hybrid housing in the greater Baltimore area. Since 2015, he's taught a community design research studio and from 2015 to 2020, worked in conjunction with the National Organization of Minority Architects to develop a travel research studio that studies and produces design proposals for communities of color across the United States. This studio has collaborated with delegates, departments, residents, ministers, and other community leaders to form design case studies in New Orleans, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, and Houston. Um, do you want to introduce our next panelist, Mary? Okay. Uh, next panelist is uh, Evan Kaufman. He is executive director of the Southeast Fairfax Development Corporation, which is a nonprofit uh, formed to, quote, develop, implement, and support projects to stimulate economic growth in the Richmond Highway Corridor by working closely with business owners, developers, and local residents. Uh, Mr. Kaufman wants to bring a stronger sense of place and identity to the corridor. Uh, previously, Mr. Kaufman served as the executive director of Hopewell Downtown Partnership, a Main Street community development organization in Hopewell, Virginia, which is near Richmond, where he facilitated the redevelopment and reuse of numerous historic properties, cultivated local entrepreneurs and new businesses, started unique festivals and farm markets, and work to bring back a sense of place for Hopewell residents. And, uh, and this, he's hoping to do some of those things in Richmond Highway as well. Uh, his work in historic preservation, economic development earned him uh, recognition from the governor of Virginia. And he helps spur a res renaissance in the downtown Hopewell community. Okay, Evan earned a bachelor's degree in political science, Virginia Commonwealth University, and get this, a master's in diplomacy and conflict studies. And there he acquired very good skills for community development uh, work. Uh, that's from the Interdisciplinary Center in uh, Herzila, Israel. He is certified by the National National Development Council as a real estate development finance professional. And he's a current candidate for a uh, Main Street America revitalizational, revitalization professional certification. Marissa, you wanna take Rodney? Yes, I'm very honored um, to introduce my, my supervisor, Supervisor Rodney Lusk, um, who's a native Virginian, a graduate of the University of Virginia, was a Fairfax County employee for the past 30 years uh, before being elected as a supervisor last year. Um, from delivering human services along the historic Richmond Highway Corridor, serving on the staff of two different members of the Board of Supervisors, Jerry Connolly and Kate Hanley, to becoming National Marketing Director at the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. Uh, Rodney has advocated on behalf of our community through his work with a number of local boards and initiatives, including the Fairfax County Committee to Prevent and End Homelessness, Leadership Fairfax, the Southeast Fairfax Development Corporation, and Bark Richmond Highway, among others. Additionally, he served as a member of both the Fairfax County Planning Commission and the Fairfax County Park Authority. Before COVID, um, Rodney got a resolution passed to set up an innovation center on Richmond Highway to spur innovation and economic growth. He sees Richmond Highway as a prime area for the placement of a technology accelerator and co-working center. He said such a facility would be the perfect catalyst for bringing the initial outside investment necessary to break the cycle of stagnant commercial development and largely undiversified employment options for those living in the Route 1 area. This area is promising because it's bordered between the two high-tech areas of Amazon influence on the north and Fort Belvoir on the south. 
So that's still in the pipeline, but the past several months, he's been running huge drive through food banks at the South County Center, helping residents get CARES funds and COVID tests and working on police reform. He's been a little busy in his first year on the board. <laughs> he's chair of the board's public safety committee, a big job this year where he's developed a plan for police reform in the county with extensive community input. And he's also co-sponsored the active Fairfax plan for bicycle trains, paths, and pedestrian safety. Um, Mary, you can introduce your supervisor. <laughs> okay, is Dan here? Yes, he's right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, hi Dan. Uh, Mount Vernon supervisor, my supervisor. Um, for those who aren't from the area, uh, Route 1 goes right down the middle between these two districts. It's Lee, Lee District on one side, Mount Vernon District on the other side. So these supervisors have to coordinate very closely together. Um, from Mount Vernon Supervisor Dan Stork, uh, since he was sworn in uh, the Board of Supervisors in 2016, uh, Mr. Stork has focused on local development, including tourism and environment. He led the Fairfax Green Initiatives, Embark and Revitalization of Richmond Highway, Strategic Economic Development Task Force, the Tourism Task Force, the renovation of the original Mount Vernon High School, the oldest high school in the county, or almost oldest, uh, which is still ongoing. And he uh, got a pretty, recently open, broken ground on the Lorton Community Center in the South County, uh, along with the Lorton Library renovations. Uh, Dan co-chairs the board's Community Revitalization and Reinvestment Committee. He's the vice chair on the uh, Audit Committee serves on the Alexandria District of Columbia, Fort Belvoir, and Prince William Interjurisdictional Committees, and the Council of Government, the Chesapeake Bay and Water Resources Policy Committee, and the Virginia Association of Counties Board of Directors. Uh, previously, he was a school board member, and in his uh, personal business life, he has developed and owned several healthcare and benefits firms. But we are pretty sure his favorite initiative is the Tour de Mount Vernon, uh, now in its fifth year, which last week drew 230 cyclists for 24 and 40 mile routes past historic and scenic parts of Mount Vernon. So thank you for that, Dan. Okay, let's, uh, now you all know who each other is. And let's uh, have um, Alexander von Hoffman uh, present to us his some slides and tell us something about uh, equitable development. All right. Um, I would do the technical thing here and see if I can make it work. Oops, come back. Um, sorry, always this little. There. Okay. Do you see what I see? Like the big PowerPoint? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Incredible. <laughs> it worked the first time. Wow. <laughs> All right. That'll be the last time that happens. Thank you, Mary, uh, and, and uh, for inviting me to this uh, important meeting, the South County Task Force. And uh, I am uh, so impressed with your panel and commissioners. It's just uh, an honor. And uh, I'm excited to talk to you all because it seems to me from what I've learned and I am by no means well versed, but Mary's been trying to catch, get me up to speed. But what I've learned about the Embark Richmond Highway project leads me to believe, and uh, if Mary has thought she was out of the box, some people consider me off the wall, so <laughs> uh, we can, but I think it offers a great opportunity to be the rising tide that lifts all the boats in this part of Fairfax County. So uh, how do I get there? Well, this is the report that Mary mentioned um, uh, because I feel that the way to do this is sort of shining star for everybody, uh, North Star uh, would be a vision of equitable development. And I got into this because about a year and a half ago, uh, the Joint Center for Housing Studies published my report that I wrote about this. That in turn, for people who are interested, grew out of a long research project that 
JP Morgan Chase and Company had supported on the collaborations of community development financial institutions. And I know there are plenty of the cognoscenti out there that call those CDFIs and you can't even remember what it stands for anymore. Um, and uh, on how these collaborations were revitalizing low and moderate income communities. And that's how I stumbled across this concept of equitable development. So what is equitable development? Well, it's a new form of community development and planning that comes out of an old tradition. I'll, I'll talk about that, but it aims to ensure that residents of, of urban places, uh, suburban, even rural places, but urban regions, especially low income people and people of color uh, can shape and benefit the development and economic growth that occurs in and around their own neighborhoods. It aims to improve and revitalize disinvested communities and promote projects that will help uh, those people who live in those communities. So that's a kind of simple, broad brush. Um, now, why has this come about? And I think Mary uh, very well put it very well in the call for this meeting. Uh, it's gentrification, the most visible form of rising economic inequality in metropolitan areas uh, is what we call gentrification. Big complicated subject, but we know it when we see it, right? And we certainly know it when we feel it because it raises the cost of living in cities and it prices out low and moderate income households. So in the face of high-end development, equitable development, offers residents ways to preserve their homes and their neighborhoods, but also uh, in some way their way of life, the cultures and traditions. So that was the trigger, but you may or may not be surprised to know most neighborhoods are not uh, uh, gentrifying. They are stagnating or declining. Uh, the in their number of population is decreasing or staying the same, the real estate values are dropping. And many of those kind of places and their residents could benefit from revitalization. But revitalization, revitalization that's done equitably to enhance and not engulf uh, communities. And uh, looking at Fairfax County, I think we see both those syndromes, right? Both gentrification and the kind of communities that are stagnant uh, and perhaps have declined in population. All right, a little bit more about equitable development. Where did it come from? Well, it has many sources and we don't have time to explore them all. I'm a historian, so I won't even get started on that. But perhaps the two most important sources are the Community Development Movement One, and that's the movement which many of you I'm sure are familiar with, but for decades, local activists have worked to redress racial and economic inequities in American society by using practical methods to improve living environments and personal opportunities in low-income neighborhoods and communities of color. So uh, th these pictures come from my book, House by House, Block by Block, Rebirth of America's Urban Neighborhoods, which was really on the emergence of the community development movement. And they uh, exemplify the affordable housing efforts of a variety of, of uh, groups and uh, uh, communities. Uh, but the community development movement is much broader than that. It, it takes many forms and many approaches to, uh, to achieve it. It's uh, sometimes called comprehensive, that's a little too much, but it, it's broad based. It takes uh, really what are the problems and what are the ways we can solve them. So that's one source of equitable development. But another is smart growth planning. I was surprised to learn this. Uh, smart growth, as you probably, I'm sure you know here in Fairfax County, was primarily concerned with fighting sprawl at first, right? Um, and uh, But in recent years, it's turned to the needs of underserved communities. And um, 
I'll have you know, I chose that map of Fairfax County for the last presentation. So this is not a special, this is very important, this map. Uh, uh, but I think it's it's very interesting if you know the work of Carlton e Eli and uh, others uh, applying this uh, whole concept. So uh, the person who really got this started, Angela Glover Blackwell, uh, she actually coined the phrase equitable development. Um, and when she, uh, early on, uh, as she founded her advocacy organization, Policy Link, uh, and uh, which calls for comprehensive, innovative ways to remedy the deepening inequities of metropolitan areas, right? And uh, for that reason, uh, many of the profiles that Policy Link has done are on a large scale, they're regional. And they, uh, as the one that was done for Fairfax County a few years ago, and it's quite a good analysis of the social, economic, and racial disparities that go on within their borders, but they do that for uh, uh, communities and, and counties and regions uh, all over the country. All right, so then the big question is, well, what starts this uh, equitable development planning title. Uh, <laughs> there we go. What starts this equitable de development planning effort is what I'm saying. And I'm mesmerized by the interesting thing that appeared in my slide. Uh, we'll go by that. Look, it can begin with a catalytic event. Uh, very close to you is the 11th Street Bridge Park, uh, which is spun off the 11th Street Bridge, the construction by Department of Transportation in the District of Columbia uh, to, uh, to build a bridge. From there came the idea of a bridge park to, uh, to, to serve the communities on either side of that bridge of the Anacostia River. And uh, from there emerged an even larger uh, scope or campaign, which was for equitable development. So there's, it's confusing, but there's an 11th Street Bridge. There's an 11th Street Bridge Park, which by the way, hasn't even begun to be built. But the 11th Street Bridge Park equitable development plan is well underway and accomplishing many things. So it can be a catalytic project like that. Or in Phoenix, it was the uh, creation of a large infrastructure, the Valley Metro Light Rail Corridor that uh, spurred it. It can be a civic crusade um, for revitalization as we see uh, in Detroit uh, has occurred. So, um, uh, and there you have the city government and an organization called Invest Detroit uh, work out of the strategic planning framework, but actually start to work on neighborhoods uh, as a large civic campaign. So uh, what makes for an effective uh, uh, economic development campaign? What, how do you do that? Um, what are the essential elements? There are many elements, but in a minimum, I would suggest the following, and I can't emphasize enough community engagement. That means meaningful community participation in planning. And I think it's wonderful that last year, I believe Mary said you really started this process. But in speaking broadly, after years of neglect of the wishes of communities of low income households, people of color, it is essential that planning for equitable development engage and mobilize the residents of affected neighborhoods. Um, and it's wonderful what will happen once that occurs uh, as far as the agenda uh, of development and planning in a particular area. And so that uh, uh, process, the uh, community engagement, should go beyond merely consulting. Residents must set the agenda and they must actively participate in or monitor the implementation of the plans for improving their own neighborhoods. Well, I'm sure you're saying to yourself, well, that's easily <laughs> easier said than done. You're right, 
it is a difficult uh, hurdle and it takes organizers. Uh, you need, to, and, and I would hope that somebody would hire some people or set aside some people from staff to go out and uh, in this particular instance and tell them, look, there's this huge uh, uh, Embark program that's going to uh, enhance the infrastructure. It's going to do all these improvements. There's a lot of money that's going into it. And a lot of money is going to be poured into development on either side. If you don't act now and get involved, it's going to pass you by. But if you do, you can channel some of that vitality and, and uh, resources, as the euphemism goes, into your communities and make it something exciting for all people. So community control. All right, but that's not all. Let's be honest. Um, we all need experts and, um, and complex projects that might grow out of this already are growing out of it, uh, out of an equitable development effort. Whatever they might be, I'll just reel off some possibilities. Uh, housing, affordable housing, financial assistance, job training, uh, all sorts of things, they require people with special expertise to assist the communities to reach their goals. So how that plays out, that's going to vary from place to place. The precise contributions and uh, of the experts, the relationships with the community leaders, sometimes the community leaders are the experts. Um, as we can tell, we've got people in the, uh, uh, in South County here, uh, that uh, are, have their own expertise. So there's no rule of thumb, but there has to be that kind of participation. And uh, uh, while it's true, I work at a data center. Um, I uh, am not a numbers cruncher myself, but I have great awe and respect for those that do. And I understand as probably everyone listening understands that successful planning, including the equitable development kind requires relevant data to help measure what are the local conditions and needs. And you sort of have a head start. You've got that old uh, policy link uh, 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 report and you've got others as well. Um, and uh, also to continue to gather data to assess the effect of the implemented program. So, so data is important. Now, no one institution can carry out all the programs residents want and need. So it's going to take collaborations. Equitable development planning calls for all sorts of partners to develop affordable housing. For example, communities uh, can seek out nonprofit or for-profit entities that are best suited to the task. So here we have an example of the nonprofit. Maybe many of you have heard of MANA. Uh, in Washington. Um, and here we have a, uh, uh, a for-profit developer, Clifford Brown, who uh, went into an area that had hard, hadn't had any development in, in uh, decades, or in, um, many, many decades, probably since the mid 20th century, and, uh, um, and developed this mixed use, mixed income building. So uh, it's gonna take all kinds of partners for affordable housing. Uh, I just give you examples here. Uh, another example might be employment and job training. Um, in uh, the 11th Street Bridge Park area, uh, the, uh, there's a, as you know, in, in the district, there's a lot of development, but there's a lot of development going on on the uh, uh, other side of the Anacostia River. And uh, the Skyland Workforce Center was able to make agreements with construction companies to funnel carpenters and other kinds of workers right into jobs. And if those workers came and they were missing some kind of skill or the resume didn't look exactly right, they would help work with them to get it right and then funnel them right into jobs. And you're going to have a, a, a lot of construction, a lot of opportunities uh, for that. I'm not going to get any further into it. I'm not going to... Uh, uh, with the experts in the room, I'm not going to tell you what is uh, uh, the way to do it, but I just suggest this is something that they did at the district and other places that work. And unless we forget, it's not all, uh, we don't live on bread alone, right? Um, there's arts and culture, and that can be 
an, uh, uh, um, an exhilarating part of, uh, of uh, community equitable development. So I don't need to tell anybody here, we have the commissioners here. Uh, nonprofits are great uh, and they play uh, leading parts frequently in equitable development. And there are for-profits too, but for this thing to work, state and local governments are essential uh, for effective equitable development planning. And I don't mean just like uh, the nonprofit or somebody, you know, virtuous people go to the uh, to the government and they knock on the door and say, "Please, would you help us with our project?" What I mean is, they're partners. Uh, they may provide their own funds. They may distribute federal monies. They might run interference with other agencies or contribute land for social projects. But they're in together with the equitable development effort. It's a joint effort, in other words. And um, equitably minded officials like the ones who are here today on the panel uh, are, are perfect uh, for coordinating both within their own agencies and within government, but also with their community partners on community projects, uh, social programs. Um, and, and sometimes they even initiate the, uh, there have been cases where they initiate the entire planning process. So it, uh, it comes out like that. So uh, you need all of those. Um, and now let me just give you a couple of suggestions looking at the uh, M Richmond Highway Corridor and the region uh, just struck a couple of ideas in what research I've done. So I'll just throw them out. Uh, not that you necessarily want to use them, but uh, it's as uh, Mary said, we were just going to brainstorm here. So here's an idea, history for equitable development. Well, your speaker is a historian, so what do you expect, right? Um, uh, but I think it's, it's a wonderful angle. And uh, maybe you know the little village of Anacostia, uh, which uh, was um, where Frederick Douglass had his home, but it was a forlorn place. I've been going there for many years, uh, 20 years ago. Um, and guess what? Uh, with a little uh, punch and of course all the uh, boom in Washington DC, but also the 11th Street Bridge and this effort, uh, this broad scale effort at equitable development. There are all sorts of things going on in Anacostia that uh, tap into its historical uh, um, heritage. Another which strikes me and it, uh, is equitable transit oriented development. This might be uh, a, a close analogy here. Um, so uh, the, uh, in, in Arizona, uh, the, um, the uh, um, government there decided to institute a, or to implement a $1.4 billion 20 mile light rail line uh, that would connect Phoenix, Tempe, Mesa. So it's quite a long way. And when they did um, a broad array, a really uh, amazing array of Phoenix area institutions founded the Sustainable Communities Collaborative. And they were nonprofits, they were for-profit companies that were active. They were all different kinds of government agencies um, uh, that got involved. And uh, there was enough of a common vision uh, that they wanted to ensure socially responsible transit service to help the low-income uh, communities along this uh, rail line and equitable real estate development the closer you got to the line. So um, just to show you what you're looking at, the low-income housing tax credit uh, development uh, down in the right-hand corner, Cedar Crossing uh, was uh, part of a, uh, a building project that also included the Patina Wellness Center, which was a substance abuse treatment that offered specialized services for pregnant women, among others. So, um, and then in the slide on the left, you can see, um, or the picture on the left, you can see the um, uh, development that's going along the light rail line. Uh, and the map itself here is to show uh, where uh, some of the partners uh, activity was along the light rail line. So there's um, 
This has been quite interesting and one of the many approaches they took. And with something like this, you don't have one thing or, you know, you have many uh, all upon location. But one of them is the, the, uh, that they got is part of the small business development and something that's uh, I'm very fond of small business development. And, um, and, but they tapped into the cultural diversity of the community. This is something that, believe it or not, people just fly by a lot. Yeah, well, we have a lot of Indian people. So what, you know, that's just what it is. But they figured out how to celebrate it and they created this spice trail, as they called it, uh, to link all the different uh, ethnic restaurants that were, uh, I believe that was in uh, uh, Tempe, yeah. Um, and so they, they found a theme and they had a small business um, uh, support a nonprofit that did uh, kinds of loans, helped these small businesses with their management of their businesses so that they could uh, expand or become more efficient. So that it was working on all different scales. So I just, uh, one could go on, but I thought those two, uh, uh, those two uh, efforts or three efforts, history and the uh, various efforts in um, in uh, Phoenix metropolitan area might spur some ideas there. Um, so just to sum up, uh, equitable development entails uh, mobilizing the people. Job one, applying specialized knowledge, creating useful partnerships, and government is so important in that. And then, ha ha ha, the little task of finding the funds to ensure worthwhile change occurs. I won't take your time with such a trivial matter as finding the money for all this. Uh, you'll figure that out. <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, but I will say there's one last uh, ingredient that I haven't mentioned, which is to make it fun, to make it, to celebrate. Celebrate your victories, celebrate the culture, celebrate the process, because equitable development is something that is satisfying to everyone who, in, who participates in it. Not to say there aren't, uh, you know, <laughs> things that go wrong. I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, give you that sunny, but, but it's satisfying, it's enjoyable, and all of life, but this kind of effort especially, to, to help uh, communities realize their own dreams is, is a wonderful opportunity. And so one should celebrate that. So uh, with that, I will just say thank you and um, turn it back to Mary and hope that that has inspired you in some way to go out and make miracles happen. Thank you, Alexander, that was inspiring. Let's, let's take a few questions uh, from the other panelists while we have you. Alexandria has to leave before the end of our time. So we're gonna take a few, let, let, let the panelists have a few questions for him. And Larissa, can you moderate that? Sure. Um, feel free to, to raise your hands if you'd like to go first. Um, otherwise I'll pick on you. <laughs> oh, Supervisor Stork, um, go ahead. Thank you, Lisa. Um, you, you, I know you were chuckling about the one thing we all recognize as being uh, the probably major challenge, which is the right funding at the right time for the right projects uh, that really complement the overall equitable development that we're looking for. Um, the other challenge that I've found, I, I've, uh, I, I started out as a community organizer um, almost 50 years ago and uh, with through uh, Volunteers in Service to America, and then I worked for um, of economic opportunity or community uh, action organizations. So I spent a number of years there, not only as, as a, a planner, but also as head of, of, uh, head of one. So one of our biggest challenges in working in low-income communities and, and, and now you know, fast forward into the Richmond Highway Corridor, one of our biggest challenges is getting connected to the folks who have lived here and really, I mean, I mean lived here truly most of their lives. And one of my personal commitments, and I know, I know others have heard me say this, because I deeply believe it and I'm deeply committed to it, is uh, we're not going to leave anyone behind. So leaving no one behind is a key part of, of the approach, the philosophy of my commitment to 
the development along Richmond Highway. That means we need to engage, uh, as you point out, um, absolutely community engagement is a central part of that, but getting community engagement is one of the toughest challenges that we face. Uh, I've recently hired, oh, about uh, several months ago, hired a community organizer, particularly uh, a Latinx community organizer, something that we, we know is a key part of the community that we've not fully engaged with. Uh, but we also, and we also, I also recently got uh, the Board of Supervisors, Rodney, and, and the board uh, approved um, providing some additional money for one of our major African-American communities, the Gum Springs community, to do really a lot of, ultimately some community organizing there as well. So two major uh, minority communities, we have some opportunity to improve that. I know, and I know Rodney can speak to this, I know that he's working similar kinds of things on the lead district side, but are there any special uh, techniques or initiatives or things that you have found to be particularly effective at uh, bringing communities together. Um, again, my focus has been trying to do neighborhoods because you seem you can get, like you can get people locally to do more than you can maybe at a bigger, you know, district meeting or even a, a meeting that that's, uh, has a lot more people that are intended to come, but a smaller group setting, if you will. Yeah, well, uh, uh... Dan, uh, I salute you. Uh, Daddy was a community organizer, so uh, I'm, uh, you know, uh, very much uh, understand how difficult it can be. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, yes, well, I'm going to say something. I mean, you you've had the experience, so I, I'm not sure I can uh, give you anything you didn't know already. But it really helps to have people who've somewhere in the line from the actual community. Uh, that are helping to organize their neighbors. I mean, it's got to be the right person, right? I mean, you know, but um, uh, sometimes the kids, this is, uh, you know, sometimes you can enlist the kids uh, to, uh, you know, maybe it's a high school project or something like that. Um, uh, it's like, it's one of those moments where you're trying to filter into all the households and who could, who could transmit that and transmit a sort of positive vibe about it, that uh, this isn't gonna be another waste of time, uh, you know, uh, that, you know. Um, so, so that's one idea. And, you know, so maybe your organizer can enlist some people or you can have a halftime of a, you know, I, I, I don't know how, you know, I'm not going go into trying to figure that out, but, um, or maybe you can get another partner to help this out. Um, but the other thing is, and, and we all know this, Food, sure. food is really good. Now I know it's COVID, so you know. Unmute your speaker. Where's your speaker? What's that? Go over on that little. I think it's somebody okay. else trying to listen. Oh, someone's just trying to to uh, listen. Yeah. So food is really. Where's your volume? Man? Do that in COVID. Um, the um, uh, and I don't know what your rules are there. Um, trying to get our governor has loosened us up a little bit so we can now go out for food and uh, we can even go in a place for foods if there are not too many of us. But so in a way, the moment runs counter to ex everything I said, mm -hmm. you want to get, you know, but you know, a lot of small groups and, uh, you know, maybe some virtual, you know, they, there might be a way of mixing and matching, but um, I do, <laughs> nonetheless, people will go out for some good food and they'll show up and then, and then you get to talk to them. And, and I don't know how you are, but I feel good after some good food. You can talk to me about most anything. Huh. Absolutely. COVID has made it hard. Oh, no problem. I had a, uh... A, a question or a comment more so and I wanted to get your response to it. Well, first off, the presentation was that great. Too. I was thinking about, you know, everything that involves community, so community development. You hit all the key points um, that I've always been thinking I've taught. And so I think that's really great and really important. One thing that I think is um, really, really um, crucial is, you know, when you look at profits and, um, and just money in general, so much is kind of determined based off of um, money, um, the economic situation of communities. Um, and a lot of times you see developers, they um, find profit in investing in communities that have now, that have um, kind of fallen by the wayside because they see a benefit of, you know, so they, they, they profit in the downfall of communities. But how do we incentivize profiting 
off of the upkeep and the, you know, in, in the um, su sustainability of communities. And so one thing I was thinking about is when you talked about partnerships, are there ways to form economic partnerships? Because when you see developers working separate, they're profiting off of the people who live in the communities, but is there ways to, you know, um, we, we create affordable housing, but is there a way to create a sort of progressive housing model where, um, you know, people who live in communities are incentivized towards, you know, profit ownership and, you know, and is there a way to partner with developers so that they both, you know, um, find economic prosperity in that process? I think that's the way that we establish sustainability. A lot of what nonprofits do um, and the movements that happen, they start things, but how do we sustain things? And I think profit is the thing that always, you know, um, brings us back to where we've been and it kind of cycles it back through again. Yeah, that is, and uh, there's a certain amount of, I don't want to say luck, but, you know, can you find those people? I think, I guess what I feel is if you have a united, uh, not a united, I guess that's maybe too strong, but a, a broad coalition doing this good stuff, it creates almost a, a kind of a suction, you know, and a, a kind of momentum to, uh, that people want to get involved in. And uh, I, won't, I will not generalize about developers, but I do know there are idealistic developers. So there are a lot of for-profit uh, developers. Some of you even do community development, but that might be going a little further, you know, that type, because they're, they're like for-profit nonprofits. But, uh, um, but, uh, um, but there, are, there are, and so in DC, uh, I don't know if you know Chris Smith, but the Smith Company has been uh, in Congress Heights. I don't know if you're familiar with these, these area over there in uh, um, uh, that part of, uh, of DC across the river, east of the river. But um, he kind of adopted, I, guess, I think where he started is he bought uh, a property that had, I don't know, it was like a lot of section eight. It was sort of uh, low apartment buildings, a big area um, and it had section eight. And then when he went out there, he looked at it and said, well, we're never going to make any money out of this if we don't have a school around here. You know, he's the, and he got more and more involved. So he's a, actually a, a terrific guy who just became involved. Now, I'm not saying your Chris Smith will show up. Uh, the opposite is Atlanta, right? I don't know if anybody's familiar with Atlanta, Georgia. They have this thing, the Beltline Road. And, you know, if you know Atlanta, it's all about real estate development and it's high end and it's, you know, um, and uh, the progress they've shown is in Atlanta is they used to have just good old boys doing the real estate development. And they, and, you know, they'd come in and say, oh, step aside, step aside, we'll take care of it. Now they have black developers doing it. It's like step aside, step aside, we'll do it. So, I mean, that's progress. I, I'll give you that, but maybe not as broad as we wanted, right? So, um, I guess what, you know, I, there's no answer, but I'm hoping that developers uh, seeing, well, I mean, the other is the negative side of it. It's like, do you really want a rundown neighborhood right next to your high-end development? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of arguments and I'm sure, uh, Howard, you, you, you know, you can come up with them um, as you go. Um, but I do think you, you're onto it, you know, it's, getting some of them on board um, uh, in, in a positive way. If you can do it in a punitive way, fine. But, you know, it's like fees up the wazoo, you know, that's fine. Um, but what would be even better is to bring them on board, right? Or bring somebody on board, which kind of helps the others, you know? Um, you know, I'm thinking, I have no idea, but say, say there's gonna be some commercial development that spins off of this, you know? and um, well, who gets to work at the at the uh, at the big super store, you know, or, or that kind of thing? You know that um, this is a way that you can kind of join in with it and make make links. So I don't know if I uh, answered your question, Howard, but there's a bunch of ideas that came off. Uh, and the only other thing I'll say while I'm talking to you is I'm sorry I missed you when you were at GSD. I, that, that's a that's a drag. <laughs> 
So while, while we have two supervisors on our board here, you know, I'd love to ask you, Dr. Van Hoffman, what are some of the major, you know, policies um, that, that, that you find need to be passed or, uh, you know, legislatively, either in the state or the local communities to make these kinds of um, developments happen and or be sustainable in the long run? Well, I don't know. I think what it needs is people like the commissioners right here, uh, uh, because everything, this is about deal making really, when you think about it. Um, and so, yes, um, you could change zoning. You may have specific things that need to be done like along the, along the corridor. Do we need to change the zoning there? Um, um, do we need, you know, all of that, but I, I wouldn't presume to give a, a formula a particular because you really got to know what it is you're trying to do. In Massachusetts, uh, we're trying to get the state, the state legislature, the governor, the Republican governor is trying to get the state legislature to approve a rule that would just say that all the towns, uh, we have a lot of you know towns and cities, municipalities, councils, uh, can approve a development process, a housing development process, by a simple majority, you know, because right now it's two thirds, which basically, you know, all you need is three sore heads and, you, you know, you're, you're done, you know. Um, so um, that's where we're at. So, I mean, those kinds of policies are definitely needed. Um, and I know Fairfax, you know, you're, you, you are, uh, you know, property rights and development, but I kind of, I kind of work with that because the thing that goes counter to it is nimbyism, right? And, and my feeling is the argument there is, um, yeah, property rights, right? Every, everybody, let's, laissez-faire means you can't control the land, right? You can't have a monopoly on the land uh, because we believe in property rights and uh, the free market. And that means a uh, developer can come in. And, uh, and if that developer has a good heart and wants to put in some people a little bit lower income, or, uh, you know, or maybe it's just a low cost, it's not even subsidized, um, so be it. That's, uh, that's capitalism. Have you seen some, have you seen architectural and design innovation um, in some of these projects? And I'd love for you know Evan and Howard to to talk through some of that as well. What what things they foresee as being part of um, equitable development projects? Do you, well, I will I will just say um, there's some wonderful uh, design that in affordable housing, things you go by and you say, oh my God, what a nice condo expense. I couldn't afford to live there. Turns out it's all for people who were formerly homeless. Okay, uh, that's nice. Um, um, I see a lot on the West Coast. I think here in Boston, we have some very nice, uh, and they don't all have to be housing. You know, they're, they're uh, commercial um, and they can be sort of creative. Um, you know, without pulling out examples, um, right, you know, which I don't have my slideshow for that one. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to, uh, to the architects uh, to, to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to say, yeah, I really enjoy that talk and I'm glad to see the conversation come around to more of a comprehensive uh, approach to community development. I, you know, there's a lot of talk obviously about affordable housing. We need affordable housing, but just building affordable housing isn't the answer. I've heard someone say, well, what if we just built, built 2 million uh, you know, affordable housing units on the most undesirable piece of land out there? Is that gonna you know, solve the problem? You know, no, because we want, we wanna be in a community. We wanna have recreation, we wanna have jobs, schools. It's about combining all of those things and, and doing it in a way that, that has those pieces. Um, but in terms of that, that question specifically, I think there are some innovative things coming down the pike, specifically uh, modular housing and mobile housing that I've been seeing. Um, there's you know, new construction methods where they can build the housing in a, a factory somewhere. And so they don't have you know, weather problems, a lot of efficiencies, and then they can ship these module, modular 
units to a place and then they can be configured into a larger structure. And they're seeing some great efficiencies on costs and being able to do that. And also the time they can deliver it. So you got to think for development, you know, if you take 18 months, two years to develop that two years, you have carrying costs going through that's making that development more expensive, which is making it harder to create affordable housing. So if you can deliver that in, you know, three, six months and at lower construction costs, and then you have maybe the county waiving certain, you know, permit fees and other regulatory stuff for affordable housing. Um, then you start getting to these, these costs that make a little more sense. Then you still may be subsidized, but, but not as much. And so um, I think there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff um, coming down. I think we are going to be have to be innovative, uh, but it does come down to money. And I think it's, it's so important that the public and private partner, because the private sector knows how to build, develop and do these things. Um, and, and they want to, as long as there's obviously an incentive, a profit incentive. And I think there's ways that the public and private can work together to make sure that that incentive isn't egregious that they're not you know profiting so crazily but a developer would be happy you know depending on the area they're looking to make you know a certain percent to make it worthwhile there's a lot of risk that developers take and so counties can help to mitigate some of that risk um, and that can make it easier to develop and do those projects um, so i think there's there's lots the last thing i wanted to say was i think there's uh, from what i've seen i come from working in a, a low-income community uh, in Hopewell, where the median income was around 38,000 to uh, Fairfax, where the median income is, you know, over 100,000. Um, and so it's very interesting to see the, the disparities, similar problems. Um, but uh, there's a guy, Eckbert Perry, who wrote an interesting article in ULI, and he used to be the chair of, of Fannie Mae. And he's talking about there's two, two ways to kind of in community development. One is uh, helping to put people into housing into areas of high means already. And then the other is revitalizing areas that are already downtrodden, but bringing the people up with it. And that's probably the, the way to get the most units at the lowest per cost is by doing the whole community revitalization, which takes a lot more work and time. Um, but that's exactly what I think the equitable development model is, is, is working on that, that larger, more comprehensive scale um, because I don't think we're going to be able to, you know, and I don't think it's a good idea to sprinkle as many affordable housing units all over in high means areas and try to put people there. I don't think that's going to solve the problem. Um, and I don't think there's enough, you, it's too expensive to do that in these, in these units. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. I could go on, but I, I'm very happy that you, you you're talking well, about that, this. And that, wrote that's that great. Evan, I'll just respond just a little bit because you triggered something in my mind. <clears throat> and I think this is something that you're talking about. Sometimes you can do things without a big project. Uh, there is, uh, and it has to do with helping the people who are there already, um, particularly, and I think this is true in some of your communities, you're gonna have elderly people who own their own houses, uh, you know, uh, and, but can they keep, can they carry on? When was the last time they, you know, fixed the plumbing or whatever it might be? So some low end loans or fix ups um, in that stabilizes first you're helping the seniors right which is so so good or the you know the homeowners uh, whatever they might be um, and then you're also creating something it's on the market but it's a small or it's probably a modest house it's not a mansion and that's good because then the next people come in could afford that you know it's not as it, it's been it's been improved, but it's not turned into like, you know, yuppie town or something like that. And uh, so I think, and that's again, uh, you know, sometimes you get banks to do that. You know, uh, certainly um, you're familiar with NeighborWorks America. They have a big, uh, you know, system for that. So just mention that. I would also like to add, you know, just a, a few things. Um, we talk about innovation and we can do innovative design from a um, kind of uh, beautification of an environment. Um, how do we actually create iconography and how do we make things look better and attract people? That's one important way. But the, one of the starts of the innovation is just how we go through the process of thinking about the way people live and how they want to progress through life. Um, we, we look at affordable housing. That's been the best response we've had in, in communities. 
but specifically looking at a community like Fairfax County, affordable housing would not last. It's not sustainable simply because the living environment, the cost of living is too high and the affordable housing um, kind of response is very stagnant and it leaves a person in one current state. A person who lives in affordable housing is typically relegated to a two bedroom apartment, you know, um, and one kind of living, living circumstance. And so when you think about that, as they want to grow and progress as an individual, as they want to do better for themselves, they're only, limit, they're only given one living style. So if we start to incorporate different types of, of affordable living, if we can create uh, design apartment buildings, multifamily buildings that actually offer in the units um, ways to change and grow, and then also outside the units in different um, apartment complexes, or not just always apartments, it's not always multifamily. You can have a townhome, row home, uh, single family detached housing that are all integrated into the affordable housing concept. And if we only have one typology, which we've, which, which we've been so focused on, it's really leaving you know, people who live in the communities in a very limited state and there's no progression there. And then the other thing, um, as far as the innovation, because that's, a, that's the thing as far as design and design thinking that we can apply immediately. Um, you know, it's not always the same ho housing typology. And that's, and that's also a conversation with developers that it always goes back to that. Um, you know, developers look at the profit margin and they look for density and yes. then they'll find a way to have a few units that are affordable um, to, to satisfy, you know, certain uh, restrictions, um, but they don't really focus on that as, a, as, a, um, as an intention. So it's kind of, you know, backhanded or, or second, second um, thought. But another, the other thing that we, that we really need, need to think about is how do we start to, um, if, if, we're at, if we're giving, you know, um, uh, people who look and apply for affordable housing discounted rates, how do we get something back from them to give to the community, right? That may be a way to actually incentivize developers to say, hey, you know what? You're, you're living here at a lower rate, but you are still a person who's capable of doing a number of things. We have this business that you can work in. We have this business that you can work locally so we can set you up with a job in a certain way. A lot of times we, we don't want to branch outside of just the housing. Living isn't just housing and we don't think about that. So if living is more than housing, if I can work and live and profit and potentially grow in a business, all at the same time, and uh, that actually offers profit for people who invest in that and then also continual growth. So that's the idea or the model, I think, that we should call progressive housing and not just affordable housing. There's a difference. It's affordable now in a stagnant you know, circumstance, but at a certain point, I wanna make more money so I can afford more. So what more can I do? And so affordable housing just as a stagnant concept doesn't fully address that. Um. Yeah. That's I just wow. want to clap right now. That's, that's all. <laughs> Me too. I just, that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you, Howard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to leave it there um, because it's too exciting. I would, I'll be here with, for your whole meeting. And uh, I just think that's wonderful. Um, and I agree with everything. And uh, so is this what I'd like to do? I'm going to come back in two years and um, <laughs> oh, this is wow! Check up on us. You got uh, that? You got that, Rodney and Dan? Two years. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll still well, be it'll here. It'll be underway. It'll be yeah. underway. You know, you'll say it's not quite done, but we're doing it. But anyway, I'm I'm so flattered and honored to meet all of you, and uh, thank you. For thank you so me. much. Uh, it's really exciting. Uh, get this feel uh, of this community. I mean, the whole region and all of you. So thank you so much. I'm gonna sign off, but uh, best of luck and uh, stay in touch. I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of your fans now. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Okay, bye -bye. Thank you, that was a great presentation. I appreciate that it. Was amazing. Thank, you. thank you as well. Thank you. Bye -bye. You too, Howard. Um, so we had a great question um, from Yolanda that talks about, you know, how do we how do we build trust um, in the Black and minority communities um, in order to get that community engagement? Um, because that is something we've struggled with in the past, um, and especially with the Embark project. I know the outreach that's happened. I live right up from from Route One, um, but anytime there's a new big announcement, it's like the first time people have heard of it, um, and it's very hard to get that engagement. Right. I'll, I'll jump in here if that's okay. So I'll say the South County uh, Task Force held a session at the South County Government Center. Larissa and I were both at it. And there were a group of uh, community members from Audubon and it became very clear uh, during the discussion with them that they did not know anything about the Embark 
Richmond Highway Plan, they were not included in the discussions around it, and they felt that they were going to lose their housing. There was a great deal of fear and trepidation, um, and it was painful. I mean, as a person who's been involved um, with the county for so long, to hear those comments uh, was very, very gut-wrenching. But I'll say, um, as a result of it, um, we've done a couple things uh, in my office. Uh, one is that we've made a commitment to identify individuals, particularly from Audubon, Creekside, and some of the other communities, to have them be a part of our land use process. Because the land use process is where all of these things began in terms of discussions with the developers, discussions with the um, community, and if the folks who are most impacted are not at the table, um, that to me is um, troublesome. So I feel that we are making some progress, at least in terms of gaining the trust back from those folks by letting them see that they can help influence, participate, and guide uh, development in their community. Um, the other thing that we tried to do, which I think is pretty central, and I think Dan started to, to, to talk about it in his um, earlier comments, and that is we want to go into the communities and meet with the residents where they are. So we've, in my office, we've held, you know, uh, now COVID-related meetings, which were basically in a parking lot, socially distanced with masks, and had conversations with um, the community to find out what issues are important to them and to get their feedback on what we should be thinking about. And I'll say, it's pretty powerful when you hear the suggestions that come from, from the residents directly and they resonate because let's be honest, they've, they've got some of the same ideas we do, but they've also got a little bit of a twist and that twist is specific to where they live and specific to their circumstance. And we don't always know that. And I think that is very, very important as well. And then I said, look, maybe the last point I'll make here is that um, to Howard's point, so Howard, I worked in economic development for 21 years in Fairfax County. So I helped bring in some of the largest employers in this county. As a matter of fact, I worked on the Microsoft deal, which was the largest deal that the county had uh, in 2020. I worked on it just before I came to the Board of Supervisors. But the thing that I noticed, which is ugly painful as well, is that we have this North and West County versus South and East County. And I don't mean this as it's intentionally done, but what has happened is that those areas north and west have the highest concentration of technology jobs. Those are the highest paying jobs in Fairfax County. So if you're gonna be working in one of those positions, you've gotta figure out how you get, if you're in South County, how do you get from South County all the way to north or west? And to be honest, on public transit, that's two hours one way which is not sustainable for a lot of folks. So what we have to figure out, and this is something I talked about and Larissa has heard this as well, is that we've got to figure out how do we attract some types of businesses to this corridor that will grow and expand and create opportunities for our residents. And we've been having conversations with the county now for the last seven months. Uh, Larissa and I have had some conversations even recently about this. Um, but the idea is that it goes to this progressive housing. So Howard, you and I, I don't know, maybe you and I are kind of sharing our thoughts here, but the idea is that we've got to create training programs, education programs, and employment programs that will allow our residents to move from these lower paying, not to say this in a pejorative way, but they're lower paying retail jobs, to move into the higher paying if they're gonna be trades, entry-level tech, medical, and other. So the beauty here is we can do that in the very community where the need is the greatest. And the idea is that we just have to figure out how we create the partnerships with the local government, with the nonprofits, and with uh, the private sector to allow for that um, connectivity. And if this works in the way that we think, we'll have a platform for people to 
have a job at the end and we'll provide a training for them step by step. And once they're completed, they'll move into employment. And the goal is that they move into employment that puts them in a middle-class lifestyle. So it will change, I think this could change the trajectory of people's lives in a dramatic way. And not just for the generation that's here today, but the generations in the future. And um, that's something that we've got to, we've got to figure out. And, 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 and we're going to figure it out on this quarter because we have the ability to do that. And we've got the talent and the interest and the commitment from so many people to make that happen. And I, I would say the key word is, is truly partnerships to build trust. I don't think you can build trust without a sense of partnership. Um, I mean, that first and foremost comes with communication. And I think those are, those are the most essential components to establish. Um, we have traditional routes that I know we all worked on, whether it's one-way routes of media letters or, or articles, or ideally two-way routes, which have to do with um, um, communications on particular issues that, and, and people in a community that are, that are key members that represent a particular issue. Obviously, Mount Vernon Council of Civic Association is, a, is probably the most critical partner that we have as a supervisor, but it, they need more folks to be engaged. They have a core group of folks who have been heavily engaged for a long time, but we don't have every community represented adequately, and it's a great sounding board and a great opportunity to specifically um, drive changes or to advocate for changes in the community, and, and they're an important relationship I know for me, as well as for my staff in, in vetting and considering and, and, and really working through issues that come up. We also have identified for every neighborhood in, in the Mount Vernon district, um, key uh, community associations or HOAs, and we've reached out to them. Um, typically it's through the president of that HOA or CA um, to try to engage them. Some engage and some don't. Um, so we're always looking for ways to try to uh, improve that. And maybe the most important thing, and, and I saw, it, especially on the school board, if you, if you mentioned mention the word boundaries, uh, you would get a lot of folks that come out and would share their concerns. In our case, if you mention, you know, development, you'll typically get a lot of folks to come out and share their concerns. But that has to feel, it has to feel like it's in my backyard. It has to feel like it's close enough. So we need to engage with the community and let them know that, that even the longer term things can have that dramatic effect. There's no way to do without, again, coming back to the word partnerships and partnerships, not only of our not-for-profits and I see many of them represented here tonight, um, but again, the HOA, CAs, Mount Vernon Council, um, much of, Rodney, of what Rodney identified are things that we absolutely have worked on and we have moving forward. The original Mount Vernon High School, a key component of that is to bring here Northern Virginia Community College, so we can offer the kinds of classes, tech classes and lab classes and, and healthcare and childcare classes, et cetera, that, that provide that leg up. And, and NOVA is noted for, for moving folks from the lowest quartile of income to the middle and upper quartiles of income. So that partnership is education, it's engagement with the community, and it's providing jobs and opportunities here, whether again, it's within our tourism industry, which is one of our major industries locally, uh, or healthcare, which is probably another key part of it, or government, which is a huge part of that. And I get, I would agree, and I think the initiatives to have incubation and innovation centers here to bring in tech companies and provide what are really more longer term, high paying jobs. I think those are also essential elements, but partnerships, we need engagement. Uh, I know that's where we are, that's what we want. and. I know Voice and others have put together some wonderful events. I, I know Housing uh, Coalition folks have put together a great event at, um, at Bethlehem Baptist. So I know we've got pieces of that, but as I asked uh, uh, Professor Von Hoffman, we, we need some other ideas. We need some other ways to bring people together. So we're always looking for that. I know my office is always looking for that. So please engage us on those. So I have a question uh, for, for Dan and Rodney on that issue. Both. I think the statistics I got were that both Lee and Mount Vernon were about 65% uh, single family homeowners and about 35% tenants, renters and apartment buildings. And the homeowner associations are good for the homeowners, but what, 
what mechanism for outreach do you guys have for tenants? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll jump here. Um, we also have a person in my staff who's focused on outreach um, and she has established relationships with uh, a number of the affordable housing uh, developments um, here, Janet Lee, Buckman Road area and specifically Coleshire, um, looking at the um, projects Creekside where we know there are some significant um, uh, issues and concerns. And I'll make the point that in our mobile home parks, and I said this earlier, we have two in Lee District. Um, we have Audubon and we also have uh, Harmony Place. Audubon's larger with 700 units. Um, the other Harmony Place is about 70. Um, we are making connection and headway into those communities as well. Uh, because in, in essence, they own the mobile home unit, but they rent a lot. And so they're basically renters. And to me, that is very concerning. Um, if you look at what's happened with um, private equity firms in the last couple of years, they've been purchasing up these mobile home parks. And what they essentially do is make no improvements. They just increase the lot rents. And if people can't pay them, they're forced out. Um, and I think, you know, that's not sustainable and that's not right. So one of the things that, and Mary, I think you and I talked about this, on preservation, I got really exercised when I found out that mobile home units are not considered affordable housing and the way that some of the different uh, projects and complexes are that are quote unquote affordable. So we ask that that be included so that when we think about affordable housing collectively, that also includes mobile home parks. And then to your point, Mary, earlier today, you asked if we could come up with some crazy idea and something that we should consider doing. I would say if I could wave a little wand, I would try to figure a way for us to make those mobile home parks opportunities for ownership so that we figure out how, and I don't know the answer right now, but this could be a combination of uh, local government and state and other entities coming together and maybe even purchasing a mobile home park. And then what I would say the next order of business would be to improve those facilities. Um, I won't name any at this point, but I would say, you know, basic things, street lights, sidewalks, just infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You know, what we expect in the community should be a part of these um, communities. And um, I think for those who want to live in a modular home, a mobile home, um, I think that option should exist, but it would be great if they could own it as opposed to just rain it and being subject to the owner's whims on what the cost will be for that lot. Great, glad to hear you say that. That's a, That's a new thinking and route one. That's great. Yeah. I'd be glad to know our next meeting in November is going to be crazy ideas about <laughs> mobile homes as affordable housing. <laughs> well, I can I can come to that one too. <laughs> great. Do we have time? I wanted to add one more. I want to add one more comment. Do we have time for? I don't know if we're closing, wrapping up or not. Oh, what time is it? Oh, we have oh, a few yeah. more minutes. Wow. Go ahead, Howard. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so one thing I, I wanted to address was that I think is also important. We had kind of talked about just kind of community engagement and how do we get the community involved. And I think that that's a multifaceted approach. Um, but it stems from one very important thing. You know, to to inspire community engagement, I think you have to ensure community empowerment. I think you have to you know, let community members know that they actually have a say. Um, I've, I've been on a number, I've, I've done multifamily housing in DC and we've gone through, you know, ANC um, kind of uh, processes and, and approvals. And I've seen it, you know, kind of trying to play the system where it's like, okay, we want to engage the community, but we want to kind of just kind of get their check and we really don't want them involved in a process. We just want to make sure that we get their okay. 
And, you know, the community doesn't feel empowered when you go through that process, when you actually are presenting to them and then they don't really know you. And then it's about, okay, do we want to approve this project or not? And then they feel like, well, I'm not an expert on this. I don't know if this is a good idea for my community or not. So, I mean, I, I guess I'm going to vote for it. And then you have some people who are more experienced, but then leveraged by certain people in certain ways. And so I think one way to empower the community is to engage them in the process a lot more. We don't really um, engage the community in a process. Um, that's one form of empowering. But then the other thing is to actually empower the community by giving them their own resources um, so that they don't have to wait for someone to come to them with an idea where they can actually um, activate their own ideas and then hire someone to push forward their agenda. And that rarely exists. You don't see where people in the community know what they need and they're, not, and they're given the resources to get what they need. And that can happen in a number of ways. I mean, developers, you know, they're generally the people with the purses and the money. But I think another thing is just how it has to go back to policy. Something in a policy has to empower people in the community to not just have ownership of, of their home. That's one thing, but then have ownership of the, of the decisions that, you know, take place around their homes. One of the problems that we see where, where you see people profit off of the demise of communities, which is a huge problem across the U.S. People yeah. profit off the demise. One, one of the biggest problems that, that really play into that is people in the community want to do something as they see their own community demise, you know, fall into demise, but they don't really have the resources to do much about it. And so until that changes, you know, we're going to continue to encounter, you know, um, community members that are deactivated. You know, they're, they're not as much willing to engage. Um, and that's one layer. There are so many other layers, you know, that I think we should do to, you know, another thing is um, uh, in the education process, more education needs to happen around community, uh, more incentive, uh, we need to incentivize more for people to stay in their communities to grow in the education of that community as well. But I mean, there are a number of things I just wanted to include just the, the focus on community engagement, especially when it's a community that's different, you know, um, a different kind of demographic than a lot of times the people who design and do work in those communities. Mm -hmm. Speaking of community engagement, Laura, do we have any, any pressing questions from our uh, listeners, our audience, of community. Yeah. Catherine, Mary, Mary, like this Catherine is Catherine. Yeah, yeah, thank you ahead. very much. Um, number one, uh, Dan, thank you for mentioning the Mount Vernon Council. Um, also, Howard, we'd love to connect with you. But just historically, the Mount Vernon Council over the years, we have reached out to the lower income housing, the apartments. We've talked about including them in our organization. We've had several of the trailer parks be part of the Mount Vernon Council and come to the meetings. They fade away, as you've said. They don't always come. They don't want to be engaged or when you try to engage them. And hopefully, um, with Dan having in his office an outreach person, we can start doing that again. And we would like very much to do that because, as you say, they are part of the Mount Vernon Council of Citizens Associations. So any help we can get from you, Howard, and certainly Dan's office would be fabulous. Thank you. Well, you definitely have my help. And I, I think it is engagement. I think the challenge is, Howard, is, is longer term engagement. I, again, I've been doing this for more than 40 years and, and you will get certain individuals who are involved and engaged but it's tough to sustain kind of a larger community at times. And so that's really the key. And that's one of the reasons I asked uh, the press to that question is, is that's, that sustainment is really where we get true people's feelings and concerns and, and help to shape really the larger community. Um, and, that's, and that's really the, the depth of where we have to go. And that's comes with the community organizer to maybe to get something started. But in the end, we need folks in a community to to see real value in that. And as, as we all know, uh, you know, and, and we've all, at least I've been there, you know, when I didn't make much money and didn't have much time, you know, doing one more thing was, was, a, was a far more difficult thing. Uh, you work in a couple of jobs and you have kids. So we, we have to make it easy, which means we have to do it in the community. We have to provide the meetings and opportunities and engagement in that particular community. And, and again, I think the concept of food is at least from my experience is an essential part of that. But it's the ongoing nature of that that really makes that happen. And in, in some communities that mobility makes it a little bit harder. Ownership usually makes it a little bit easier because not only do they care about their house, but they usually care about their, their surrounding communities and, and how that affects them. 
it's much more difficult. And Mary, I think your point about organizing um, our tenants and organizing folks in some of our, our uh, rental housing is an essential part of that. And that is absolutely a key role that, um, that uh, Diego, that's his role in particular uh, as part of the community outreach that he's doing. But um, it, we, in the end, we rely because we are you know, one or two people, we rely on the partnerships and relationships with everybody else. I see Leah Tonorio on here and, and always the great work that she's done with, with Good Shepherd Church and the community organizing and how important that is to our office and connecting and bringing people together to share ideas and to, and to address concerns that, that may be related to the transportation and other things we're doing. So again, I know there's many of you here that are part of that partnership, but I, there is no other way for us to do that. And, and I'm happy to to put something larger together, but I know there's already groups out there that do a lot of the organizing. We just need to can make sure we're connecting us all together as we do that. Well, Mary, I'll let you have the last word and close this out since we're at we're at 8:30. Um, but thank you to all of you for making the time um, to be with us tonight. Um, Howard, I'm going to call you at some point this week because <laughs> I feel like we have to talk. Um, I just, I think your points about about having it be an integrated community that that is thoughtful about home ownership and rental and sustainability and making sure that you know the community has incentive to stay in place um, and and grow roots and also to build equity um, for that next generation is important and is a very difficult thing I think to do um, in a, in a collaborative way. Well, thank you, Rosa, for moderating this. It was very good. Our panelists were great. Our speaker was great. And I, I guess I'm supposed to end it, but I really see this as just the beginning. We did record this. I see the light is on. <laughs> and we're going to uh, send it around to some people who weren't able to come at this time. And we really want to spur this discussion. We want to really get this to be a widespread kind of discussion about how we really make good communities in the Route 1 community. I call it the community, not the corridor, because that's what I'd like it to become. And um, so please think of continuing this with us and taking some of these ideas to the different uh, places that you're engaged in. And we will continue as well. And like I said, our next our November meeting is going to be on mobile homes as affordable housing. Yeah, you know, we will bring in some more experts with some advice and experiences in different places to give us some new ideas about how to do that. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you all.